to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Siding officer, since this is the last opportunity we will have, I would like to offer Parliament a very brief update on our work to secure a future for Scotland's steel industry. Negotiations with Liberty House and Tata Steel and the Scottish Government are continuing as we speak to secure the basis for an agreement that would see Liberty House buy and operate the DL and Clydebridge steel plants. The final due diligence on that agreement is taking place at present. The agreement would be facilitated by the Scottish Government and involve us buying the plants and then immediately selling them on to Liberty for the same consideration. Fergus Ewing is attending the Scottish Steel Task Force this afternoon and will provide further details at that point. In the meantime, I want to thank the workforce, the unions and the companies for their patience and perseverance. We promised we would leave no stone unturned in our efforts to secure the future of our steel industry and that is what we continue to do. Yeah. Okay, so That is indeed very encouraging news, First Minister. And can, I... Order. and can I put on record my thanks to all those members of the Steel Task Force for their hard work and determination, and notably on my own benches, uh, Drew Smith, James Kelly and John Pentland, and indeed our trade union partners. During the UK general election last year, Nicola Sturgeon said she would reverse George Osborne's tax cut for the top 1%. Pledging to reintroduce the 50p top rate of tax, the First Minister said it is right that those with the broadest shoulders pay a little bit more. Yesterday, she changed her mind. The SNP will now go into this election with a commitment to keep George Osborne's tax cut for those earning more than £150,000 a year. Even though we now have the power to make different choices from the Tories. Why does the First Minister no longer think that the richest 1% should pay their fair share? First Minister. Raising the top rate of tax to 50 pence could raise zero money because of the ways in which people can avoid paying tax. These are not my words, Presiding Officer. These are the words of Kezia uh, Dugdale. Now, let me say this and say it very seriously to the people of Scotland. Raising the top rate of tax would be politically easy to do. Uh, there are only 17,000 people in our country who pay it. There's no political risk attached to doing that. But doing it in the face of analysis that says that right now it could actually reduce the amount of money we have to invest in our national health service and our public services would not be radical, it would be reckless. It would not be daring, it would be daft. So we will not do it straight away. Instead, we will continue uh, to consider it in light of our experience and analysis. And in the meantime, presiding officer, uh, we will put forward fair, reasonable and progressive tax proposals. We will ask the better off in our society to shoulder a bit more of the burden. And over the life of the next parliament, our proposals, local and national, will raise an additional £2 billion of revenue. Revenue we can invest in our national health service, in our public services, and in mitigating the impact of Tory austerity. That is why I'll be proud to ask the people of Scotland to back our plans. order. <laughs> You know, President Officer, the First Minister should really pay attention because since I made those remarks, Her Majesty's Revenues and Customs has made it harder for people to move their tax liabilities throughout the United Kingdom. But do you know what? We have heard time and time again excuses made about how the richest could avoid paying more taxes, that there would be a mass exodus from Scotland. It's just we normally hear it from the Tory party, not from the First Minister. And, presiding officer, it wasn't just at the general election that the First Minister claimed to support the richest few paying their fair share. On the day of the Smith Agreement to devolve the power over tax, she told this chamber, if I was taking that decision now, yes, I would raise the top rate of income tax to 50p. Yet now she has the power to reverse George Osborne's tax cut for the very richest and stop the cuts. She refuses to use it. 
This is the First Minister who made her name as the anti-austerity champion. She went down to England and said she would stand up to George Osborne's tax cuts. Yet the minute she gets the powers back home, the First Minister chooses not to act. It is no surprise that the STUC, the representatives of Scotland's workers and trade unions, described the First Minister's tax plans as timid and difficult to fathom. I want to ask the First Minister the same question the STUC posed yesterday. If the SNP can't summon the courage to propose major progressive change at this moment in time, will they ever? First Minister. First Minister. I, I'll leave Labour, given that it remains in a battle for second place in this election, to indulge in political gestures. I will get on with putting forward the proposals, Order. The proposals that will see this country governed Wish. fairly and progressively. HMRC can't stop people moving house. If just 7% of top uh, taxpayers were to do that, uh, we could lose in Scotland £30 million a year. That's £30 million less for our National Health Service and for our public services. So I'll go on with doing the right thing. That is why we are asking, we are asking people, Order. We are asking people in the top 10% of income earners in our country to forego the George Osborne tax cut. It is why we are asking those living in the biggest houses Order. in our country to contribute a little bit more so that over the next parliament we can generate an extra £2 billion to invest in our National Health Service, to invest in our education system, to mitigate against Tory austerity. These are the sound principles, the sound policies that we are putting forward, which is why we know, which is why Order, we know, let's hear the First Minister. We, go in, we go into this election with unprecedented trust amongst the people of Scotland. And there we have it, presiding officer. A nationalist First Minister arguing that Scotland can't go it alone on tax really takes the biscuit. Why does this all matter? Because after nearly a decade under the SNP, there are 4,000 fewer teachers in our classrooms, 152,000 fewer college students, and the gap between the richest and the rest in our schools as wide as ever. The new tax powers mean we can change that. Last week, the Teachers Union, EIS, called for all parties to protect all education spending in real terms over the next five years. Because of the tax plans we have set out, Labour can make that commitment. The SNP's tax plans don't raise anywhere near enough to do the same. Why won't the First Minister stop the cuts to education? First Minister. Well, first of all, let me say uh, to Kitty okay. Dugdale, we are going it alone on tax. We're rejecting the George Osborne tax cut that John O'Donnell and Jeremy Corbyn are supporting it. So we are taking the decisions that are right for Scotland. We're also taking decisions... Order, let's hear the First Minister. We're also taking decisions that will allow us over the next Parliament to invest three quarters of a billion pounds in tackling attainment in our schools. I am proud of the record of this government presiding officer. We have more people working in our health service. We've got some of the best and fastest treatment anywhere in the UK. We've rebuilt or refurbished a quarter of all schools across our country. We've got the best lever destinations on record. Young people going into training or education or work more than ever before. This government has a record to be proud of, but there is much more to do. And I am looking forward to persuading the people of our country that me and this government are the people to get on and do that job. She won't raise the basic rate, she won't fully reverse the higher rate and she won't increase the top rate. Yet Nicola Sturgeon wants us to believe that she can find the money to protect education. It's utter nonsense. <laughs> 
This First Minister, who has campaigned for years on the mantra that more powers means fewer cuts, now refuses to use the powers to stop the cuts. The First Minister, who says education is a priority, won't ask the richest 1% to pay more to invest in our schools. The SNP say they are an anti-austerity, but are content to use this Parliament as a conveyor belt for Tory cuts. Faced with the choice between using the powers of this place and passing on Tory austerity, Labour will use the powers. Why is the First Minister's choice always more cuts? First Minister, Mr. Officer, I think it will be a long, long, long time, Order. a long time before the people of Scotland uh, forget the grotesque sight of Labour campaigning with the Tories to keep Scotland subject to Tory governments now and in the future. That's why they're paying a price. Order. The tax, the tax proposals we will be proud to put forward in this election will raise an additional £2 billion for our public services and to enable us to mitigate against Tory austerity. And you know what we have, uh, presiding officer, in this chamber are Tories telling us we're taxing too much. Labour telling us we're not taxing ordinary working people enough. I suspect the people of Scotland will look at what we're offering and say it is right proper and sensible and progressive and that is why they will choose us to continue to govern this country. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no immediate plans. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, this SNP government wants to impose a named person on every child in Scotland. They want to do it over the heads of parents against the wishes of the majority of this country and against the concerns of many, including the police, who believe it will take resource Order. away from the most vulnerable families who need it most. The First Minister now claims that the scheme, due to start in August, is somehow not mandatory or not compulsory and that parents can choose not to have anything to do with it. Can I ask her to make it absolutely clear today? Are parents who don't agree with this scheme able to stop their child from having a named person and withdraw their child from all named person provisions. First Minister. Well, as I have said, and I'll say again today, uh, the named person scheme is an entitlement. I think it is a good and sensible entitlement. It is not an obligation. Uh, it helps children and families get the support they need from services when they need it. It does not in any way, shape or form replace or change the role of the parent or carer or undermine families. The fact of the matter is, and this is the fact that I think all of us should seek to remember, presiding officer, it is not possible, however hard we might try, to predict in advance which children might become vulnerable. Uh, the, named service, the named person service is intended to ensure or to help ensure that we don't have have children falling through the net. It's not a state guardian. Uh, the legislation builds on the role of teachers and health visitors, the role they've long uh, held in relation to children. And it's not a new approach. It's already operating across much of Scotland. So the new legislation makes good standard practice across uh, our country. I think when it comes to protecting our children, we should be prepared to make sure that the right support services are in place and they are available when and if they are needed for every child. Ruth Davidson. Yeah. Well, that was anything but clear. Presiding officer, can I remind the chamber that the Scottish Conservatives laid specific amendments to the bill allowing parents to opt out of the name person scheme. And those amendments were voted down by her party and shouted down by her minister, who said such state guardians were to be a universal service. Every child from birth to 18 with Order. a named person attached. A named person with access to private and sensitive information all recorded in a database and able to be accessed without the consent or even the knowledge of the parents in some cases. Presenting officer, named person legislation is so sweeping and now so unpopular that it's no wonder that the First Minister is trying to spin her way out of it. But isn't it dishonest to suggest 
that a parent choosing not to engage with a named person is the same thing as being able to stop their child from having one imposed in the first place. First Minister. The fact of the matter is that the children and parents are not legally obliged to use the named person service or take up any of the advice or help that is offered to them. But it will be available to them if they need it at any point in the future. Because as families around this country will understand, families that today are coping very well and for whom there are no issues do not know what the future holds. Uh, none of us know which children may fall into a position where they are vulnerable or at risk. That is why the availability of the named person service is right to be on a universal basis. But let me repeat again today, it, parents are not legally obliged to use it uh, because it is an entitlement, not an obligation. I think that's sensible. Making sure it's there for everybody uh, when they do need it, if they do need it, but not obliging anybody to use it if they feel they don't need it. That strikes me as a sensible way to ensure the protection of our children. And the protection of our children, presiding officer, surely should be the one thing that unites all of us across this chamber. Question three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Well, the Cabinet will not uh, meet again uh, now until after the election and uh, the new parliamentary term. I hope they'll take nothing for granted that I'll be chairing uh, that next meeting of the Scottish Cabinet uh, and it will discuss matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Well, Rennie. So the First Minister's big idea on tax is the status quo. To do literally nothing at all. Isn't she just a little bit disappointed that after waiting for 80 years to get these powers, she has been so timid with them? First Minister. Well, I would just remind Willie Rennie of the budget that took place in the last uh, Westminster government, when I seem to remember a certain party uh, was part of that government. Uh, when George Osborne took the decision uh, to reduce the top rate of tax, the then leader and Deputy Prime Minister said it was a budget every Liberal can be proud of. So <laughs> Willie Rennie may want to rewrite history, but I suspect the memory of the people of Scotland will be a lot longer than his. And on the question of uh, my party's policy, we will put forward and are putting forward fair, balanced and progressive tax policies that will raise additional revenue to invest in our public services, but will do that without clobbering ordinary working people across our country. Willie Rennie. She, she claims that this will raise, what, a billion pounds. But the official, the official press release yesterday, which said additional revenue of more than a billion pounds, but it also said no taxpayer will see their bill increase. <laughs> so if nobody pays any more, no government can spend any more. That means the opportunity to transform education is missed. It means nursery education targets will be missed. The attainment gap in schools will keep being missed. And the colleges that have been hammered by the SNP will stay on their knees. Big change needs big, bold measures. That's why the Liberal Democrat penny for education works. And her plan does not deliver. Is she prepared to say to Scotland's teachers parents and pupils, that they are not worth a penny more. First Minister. Well, Willie Rennie has just displayed in that question uh, breathtaking ignorance of how the fiscal framework that's been negotiated between the Scottish Government and the UK Government actually works. I suggest he might want to go and read it before he goes any further. The truth of the matter is our tax proposals, our proposals for income tax, our proposals for local taxation over the life of the next Parliament will raise an additional £2 billion to invest in our public services, our health service, our education system. And of course, uh, that extra revenue will also enable us to mitigate Tory austerity. Tory austerity that first started while Willie Rennie's party was propping up a Tory government. Question number four, Kevin Stewart. 
Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, and a the very best, Quine. To ask the First Minister what actions the Scottish Government can and will take to create a fairer Scotland in light of recent UK Government decisions. First Minister. Well, just months after the tax credits fiasco, the UK Chancellor has had to backtrack on his deeply misguided plans to cut benefits to disabled people. Uh, that's a cut that would have seen a loss of thousands of pounds a year for 40,000 disabled people across Scotland. The decision to cut benefits uh, was ill thought through with a lack of any consultation and any evidence for change. Uh, this is in contrast to the Scottish Government, which has had extensive consultation with users and organisations about the direction of new devolved powers, including employability and social security, uh, which will be underpinned by principles of dignity and respect. Uh, we have made clear that boosting economic growth and tackling inequalities go hand in hand uh, and we will uh, use these new powers to create a better and a fairer Scotland and that is what I hope to be able to continue to do in the next session of Parliament. Kevin Shoup. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, the Tories have definitively shown themselves to be the nasty party with continued attacks on disabled people and our social security system, which was of course designed to provide a safety net to protect our most vulnerable folk. Can the First Minister assure me and disabled people in Scotland that the Scottish Government will continue to offer them the protection that they need and deserve? First Minister. Well, when you've got a situation where Tory policies are uh, too cruel and a step too far for Ian Duncan Smith, then I think we know uh, how far adrift the Tories have gone. And I think it is uh, to the, the shame of the Scottish Conservative Party that they did not speak up against these disability cuts before Ian Duncan Smith's resignation. Uh, we are firmly committed to promoting and protecting equality and human rights for disabled people. That is why we are implementing the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have invested £50 million in the Self-Directed Support Act to give disabled people greater control over their lives. Uh, and of course, when the Tories cut the Independent Living Fund, uh, we created our own fund uh, and put extra money into that fund. Uh, we are also fully mitigating the bedroom tax to protect 72,000 households, 80 per cent of which have a disabled adult. Uh, living in the household. And as soon as we have the powers, uh, we will make sure we abolish the pernicious bedroom tax once and for all. So this is a government that's shown by action and by deeds that we will create a Scotland that is fair and inclusive for all of our citizens. Question five, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. May I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the call from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities for a constitutional convention to restore and strengthen local democracy? First Minister. Well, we welcome COSLA's 2014 Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy and the continuing contribution they're making to the debate. Uh, passing power to communities is at the heart of our uh, community empowerment agenda. For example, through the Community Empowerment Act, we have given communities a much greater control in public decision making and a voice to communities in the decisions that matter to them. Uh, we have also supported that increased democracy with our Empowering Communities Fund. Importantly, we have also enabled Scottish councils to reduce business rates to reflect their local economic development priorities, uh, which will also further help strengthen local democracy. Chris Smith. I uh, thank the First Minister for that answer and wish uh, her, you and all members well, President Officer. Um, would it not be a fitting legacy of the debate we have had in this Parliament about our own powers um, to, uh, to engage with the proposal of a constitutional convention and finally restore local government in Scotland rather than simply local administration? First Minister. Yes, I I, I do think that's a fair point, and uh, let me say, I know Drew Smith is standing down from this Parliament. Can I uh, praise him for the contribution he's made and wish him every success for the future? But I do think we have an opportunity in the next Parliament, as we take more powers, to decide uh, what powers are best devolved to other parts of Scotland. I'm sure COSLA will be a constructive partner in that discussion, and I very much look forward to having it. Question number six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the modernisation of the Land Settlement Act. First Minister. The Land Settlement Act was an attempt to address specific concerns uh, 100 years ago. The Land Reform Bill that was passed by Parliament last week is a further step in this Government's journey towards uh, a more equal and socially just Scotland for the 21st century. The provisions in the Bill, including a new right to buy and the establishment of a Scottish Land Commission, build on our wider programme of land reform and plans for future action in the next parliamentary term. While we will consider all suggestions, uh, we think our continuing work in this area is the best way to ensure that those who wish to acquire land in Scotland have a range of opportunities to do so. Patrick Harvey. 
I certainly recognise the value of the land reform legislation that we've just passed. Uh, last week, most of the Parliament united to support that legislation. And even those of us who wished that at times it could have gone further agreed that it was the right direction of travel. The Cabinet Secretary, uh, in moving the, the bill at stage three, stated his view that the bill is not the end of Scotland's land reform journey. We still have hugely concentrated patterns of land ownership in Scotland, and that needs to change. So does the First Minister not agree that a modernised Land Settlement Act would be a natural next step in Scotland's land reform journey, that it could unlock the power of our land and see many more people able to access land for productive use, for food, for homes, for regeneration at a human scale, ensuring that Scotland's land is put to the use of Scotland's people all our people to serve the common good instead of the private interests of a tiny entitled few. First Minister. Well, let me say to Patrick Harvey, if uh, we are re-elected in a few weeks' time, I'm happy to consider uh, whether a, a reformed Land Settlement Act uh, does fit into our wider plans uh, for further land reform. Uh, I agree with the sentiment of Patrick Harvey's uh, question. I think we've made huge strides forward in this Parliament, but as the Minister did say last week, it's not the end uh, of the journey. There is still work to be done on land reform, and I hope this uh, Parliament, when it is re-elected in whatever uh, shape, uh, form or, or balance after the elections in May, will take forward uh, this journey uh, and do so with the same ambition and spirit that was shown in this session of Parliament. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Will the First Minister ensure that the current planning review helps, not hinders, the much more diverse pattern of land ownership that will assuredly flow from the Community Empowerment Act and the Land Reform Bill? First Minister. Well, the Community Empowerment Act and the Land Reform Bill have increased the opportunities to allow communities across Scotland to own land. The planning review uh, that has been undertaken by an independent uh, panel uh, will make recommendations in due course and uh, we will respond to that panel's recommendations uh, when we have them. But I can assure uh, the Chamber that land reform and community empowerment will be key drivers for any further uh, planning reform that we undertake. The Scottish Government will continue to do all that we can to encourage and support responsible and diverse land ownership. And of course, we have a target of one million acres in community ownership by 20. 20. President officer, can I uh, say that I think it's very appropriate that Rob Gibson's last question in this Parliament is on land reform. This is an issue that Rob Gibson has championed for decades. And our new land reform bill uh, is, I think, in large part, testament to his campaigning. I thank him for his work and I think he will be a great loss to this chamber. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also ask the First Minister if she will promote community and cooperative forms of ownership as part of the land reform agenda in the next term of the Scottish Parliament? We have seen many community renewables projects across the country, and with the opportunities in the new Land Reform Act, let us see that opening up to our urban communities as well, so that we have democratic accountability and value and community benefit shared across our communities through the cooperative model. First Minister. Uh, well, can I firstly thank Sarah Boyack for her assumption that I will be in this seat uh, when we return uh, after the election. I uh, certainly appreciate uh, the vote of confidence that she has just shown in this government. I, of course, take nothing for granted. I'll be campaigning hard over these next few weeks to earn the right to be back here governing our country. If we do persuade uh, the people of Scotland that is uh, the right way forward, then yes, I will be very uh, keen to see us take forward uh, land reform based on the kind of principles that Sarah Boyack has just outlined. And I hope we will have many uh, members, old and new, across this chamber who join us in the next phase of that journey. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the situation of Lord Apetsi, a student at Strathclyde University in my constituency. I'm Who's sorry, Ms White, uh, this question is on land reform. I know how important your question is. I've tried three I'm, times already, I'm, I'm President sorry. Officer. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms White, um, but no, you okay. need to follow the question. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. Right. We now move to the next item of business.